Welcome to the Three Man Weave Though. Here with that man, Tyler, also known as Chef What You Want, and official fan sided writer. He's a Wizards insider. Not in, he's not he's not like inside the Wizards. Like he's not out here hanging out with Gandalf or nothing. But he writes for the, he writes primarily Wizards stuff. You go check him out on fan sided. Jalen Dixon. We are here. Talk about the draft, as you know. The uh, NBA draft happened approximately a few days ago. I'm going to put a number in front of the screen because I don't know the day that was. And we are here to give our reaction, our thoughts, who won, who lost, the steals, the surprises, the disappointments, the drama of the NBA draft. As a Wizards fan, I'm not going to say anything for approximately about two minutes. I'm going to let the two guys who know way more about college ball, who know way more about these guys, speak. And, and then I will I will throw my sodium all over the podcast. What did y'all think? NBA draft winners. <clears throat> winner. I know I said they weren't winners before we got on here. But the winners <laughs> are the Cavs and the Celtics. Let me explain why. The Cavs, I think, are underrated with what they're going to do next year. And I think a lot of people, when they were saying the Cavs didn't draft good, was because they didn't consider the fact that the coach we have is a Two guard kind of coach, and that's the kind of system he plays. And he's been playing it for years at this point. So if anybody knows how to play a two guard system, it's this guy. And it sounds like Colin Sexton has already bought into the system of that. And Darius Garland is looking eager to work with him anyway. And they're both, I think they'll both be fine going into the season. And then my other winner is the Celtics. Now, I can understand why they could also be considered the losers in this draft because they, nobody thought they were going to keep all these picks. But considering you already know at this point you're pretty much going to lose Kyrie, you already know you're going to lose uh, Al Horford, possibly. You picked up a decent shooting guard off the bench in Romeo Langford, who's a pretty much a pure scorer, score, as far as I know. Then you got uh, Grant Williams from Tennessee, who I really like as a new player for to come behind Al Horford. Although I prefer if you kept Al Horford to have him learn Al Horford before he left. But now that they're hitting in there, I think Grant Williams would be pretty decent for them. They got Carson Edwards, who, if you don't know, in the March Madness was just going crazy with dropping buckets. I can't, I don't know off the top of my head how many points he was dropping, but he was just letting the rain from deep. And he took part, he basically took Purdue all the way to what, the Elite Eight, I think, before they got eliminated. And they got a Pierce score, and then they got another point guard later on in the draft. I guess just as, you know, safety precautions in case, but you know, I don't know if they'll really get. They're both their point guards that can Terry Rozier and Kyrie. I guess I like the pitch for now. And if they even if they do get somebody like Terry Rozier back, they you still got two point guards behind them ready to learn and things like that. I guess I'm going to just go one winner, one loser, just so we have somebody. Because there's a lot of people that lost. I'm not even quite lying to you. <laughs> but I would say the one winner, it has to be Memphis. And I don't even think it's because they got John Moran. I mean, I feel like, I mean, they got gifted that pick. As much as I was looking at a podcast the other day, as much as people people think that like the draft was rigged, having Memphis at two was the easy, easily one of the like biggest like underrated placements in that entire draft when the draft order came out. Like no, everybody was worried about those top four teams, and just took Memphis out of it. I think a moving on from Conley and being able to get a huge haul out of that with Grayson Allen. And, I mean, Kyle Culver, I don't think he's going to be on the squad, like, to be honest with you. I think they're probably just going to, like, waive him or they're going to buy him out, which, I mean, makes plenty of sense. He's an older player and they're going for a rebuild. Grayson Allen's a huge scorer that I feel like can grow into that wing spot. But I think, I mean, I, honestly, I think their winner is bigger off of not just the John Moran pickup, but getting Brandon Clark down the line. I mean, that's somebody who was projected top. 10 to 15 and fell all the way down to them at I think it was like 21 or something like that to be able to get that that's a huge value pick put him next to Triple J at that center spot I mean you're gonna have a lot of a lot of lobs a lot of actions you can run off he's a really they're gonna have a really athletic team off of that I think the biggest loser it took me a minute to really figure it out but I think the I think the Pacers really messed this up I mean they only had one pick and they went with a center where now, I mean, right before podcast started, the, the question was, is he a draft and stash player? 
if he's a drafting stash player at 18, something, something ain't right. That's their only pick in the entire draft. And we, they went with a potential drafting stash player with Miles Turner. And I guess it's a bonus still at that center spot. So you just overlapped your center spot when you have an injured guard coming back. And Tyreek is banned from the league for two years because of like drug use. So, I mean, you had forward spots and guard spots you could have addressed, and they picked a center, I guess, just because of, like, BPA. I'm definitely assuming they picked him just because he was one of the best players on the board. Swung and probably missed, even though it's a good talent. It just doesn't fit. Those are their winners. Tyler, did you have any losers before I... Um... The loser was the Lakers. I like their one pick of Taylor Horton Th- Tucker because he definitely slid a lot. But for you to only have gotten one pick and you were shopping... For multiple second round picks to try to put on your roster, and you get one, that's kind of like terrible. Considering as many trades there were in this draft, it was like, he's like, you couldn't get nothing to go where you go your way to pick up some players. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you think about it like this, you lost out on DeAndre Hunter as well, who I think is going to be pretty good, especially on Atlanta. I don't remember all that stuff at all. But either way. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> so okay. Um, you know, I, I'm totally not a fan of any specific franchise at all. <laughs> not a fan of any franchise at all. No specific. I have no dogs in the draft fight. I simply love to see young players achieve their dreams. If it happens to be in, I don't know, Washington D.C., that's cool. Yeah, winners and losers for me. I'm just gonna say winners. Uh, I'm just gonna go with. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be a, a lame person and go with the crowd and say. The Pelicans and the Hawks, like, guys, no one's talking about the Pelicans. The Pelicans got freaking Zion and, like, a, a bunch of picks because it traded with Atlanta for, for freaking 8 and 9. Holy crap, dude. Okay, it wasn't 8 and 9, but it was, like, 8 and 17, whatever. Pelicans got a lot of picks, and both Pelicans and Hawks' young core is going to be godly if we trust that they're going to develop like it's 2K. Those are the winners and losers I can think of off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> Losers. <laughs> as a Wizards fan, you know, as a as a non-committal fan of Wizards, I feel like our draft pick, Rui Hachimura, he, as a person, really nice, really great. From what I have heard and what has been told to me through the audio channels in the universe, <coughs> the podcast of basketball, many different people dissecting this pick all seem to agree that it was not good. And also, the fact that the Wizards need a center not named Dwight Howard. Not knowing, I'm, I'm stealing that one from Jalen because he said that, but it's fine. Because we both think on the same wavelength all the time. You know, we just continue to do the whole when Guardian Levio suck. And it's just it's driving me nuts. It's driving me insane that we refuse to pick up a center. Because Gogo Bidatse, I think that's more of a Pacers deciding that they're going to move on from one of the centers. But we can get into that a little bit later. But for the Wizards, it's picking up a forward that does not really have a necessary... Like, he, he's going to be trading off shots with Beal because Wall's out for, like, the rest of, like, the next generation. And the rest of the team is kind of unfounded. We don't really have really set positions beyond shooting guard, maybe point guard, because Tom- Tomas Sadoransky will definitely start. Small forward is just in the air. Power forward's in the air. And center is the only one in the air that should have been caught. We should have grabbed that out of the air and put it back on the ground. But it keeps, def- it, for some reason, every general manager wizard, they continue to defy my mind and just say, you know what you need? You don't need a center. Also, the other loser is the Suns because they didn't get a point guard. Well, they did, but they got him all the way at the end. And I just feel bad because as a Wizards fan, I just want to say, Suns fans, I, I'm right there with you. Y'all can't get a point guard because your GM's allergic to it, and I can't get a center because my GMs are allergic to it. Even when we fire the GM manager and get an interim one, who was under him, so we should get rid of him. Before. But I don't want this to turn into a Wizards rant, so I'm going to leave it at that. The only reason I think it's sort of a loss is because, again, the Wizards do not... They don't have really good player development when it comes to that. It's usually the talent just supersedes the actual foundation in front of them sort of like just being talented in a shitty environment you can still be talented but that doesn't matter if your environment doesn't really nurture you and give you that growth that allows you to really flourish versus just kind of flourishing so yeah Rui Hachimura I really hope he does well there's nothing really giving me much faith beyond like the raw talent I felt that actually <laughs> there's a lot a lot of salt, salt pouring in that I, I could I could I see some steak right now you know and just, I got all the sodium in the universe right now I think I think the biggest thing is when you look at it you, you have to look at the you have to look at the draft as like 
just a, a starting point from it. Without an actual GM in place, you can't take too much away from the draft, and you have to look more at the prospect than his fit because the fit isn't. You can't say there's a fit on the team without a team mentality in place. When you have Beal and you don't know what to do with him, when you have five people signed on a contract, four now technically because Jabari is opting out. So even if you sign him back, like Jabari's opting <laughs> <laughs> you got mad 3D. Whoa. Hello, yeah. little person. Oh, man. I was trying to process. Uh, just you move went. up. Just a little bit. Because when you sit up, the audio is better. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> okay, okay. Damn. 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 Wait. I didn't say move in. I said move up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get in the fucking phone call, bro. <laughs> He had to just be like, you know what? I look good right now. Let me look at my leg. <laughs> Yo. Yeah. I have abs. I like just worked off the calzone I ate, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. That's oh, funny. shit. Like, I don't even know what Jalen was saying before that. I figure out where to reassess now. <laughs> Oh, okay. I mean, because, I mean, essentially, though, the whole point I was trying to make was just the fact that, like, the team has no layout as to what exactly their future is. So you just have to judge the pick for what it is because he has no fit right now with the whole roster needing to be filled out. I already told you before, before we even hopped on the podcast, bro, there's no way in the world that they don't go out and look for a point guard. And if they don't, I'm going to shoot myself because there's no way I can write about Thomas Sadoransky for six months. What it's not going. Do? It's not going to work out, bro. Like, that's a little selfish on my end, but like that's not a hooper, bro. That's not a hooper. He's just not. He's a good backup point guard. That okay, a good backup point guard is not supposed to be running your first unit, bro. He's the first unit divided by point five. No, dude. That that's math, right? That can't be. That can't be the type of energy we look at this with, bro. Like that, that that that's the type of thing that okay. Take all trades that took place on draft night into into account, right? Instead of standing pat with no direction with Bradley Beal right now, why in the world do we not look at it as okay? We have no direction with Bradley Beal. There's no way in the world with this cap hell that we can build around Bradley Beal. We have one pick. One, we had to trade for Admiral Schofield. Like, that's the biggest thing about this. Yes, we came out of the draft with two picks, but one of them was not our pick. So it didn't work out. So, I mean, we basically traded for him. So instead of that, trading Bradley Beal for the fourth pick and some picks, because obviously, like, I mean, we probably could have gotten the 38th, I think it was, that the Pelicans had on the side that was in the second round out of that. And instead of keeping the fourth pick, we flipped that with Atlanta the same way the Pelicans did for the 8 and the 17. If we come out of the draft with four picks, yes, we move on from Bradley Beal. But if we're gonna do a re if we're gonna do a reboot, if we're gonna run this, run this back, if we're gonna like run over the whole thing, tear it apart and start it back up. The first way you can do that is by having four shots in a draft that basically after the first three people, the talent level is pretty evenly distributed. It's not like anybody, like there's this one person that's super trash or this one group of people that's super trash, one group of people that's very solid, and then just the three. It was pretty evenly distributed to the point that Brandon Clark fell to 20 or 21. So, if you have four shots at drafting, wouldn't it be better than keeping Bradley Beal with nowhere to go? Or, like, that was just me? Because that's where I looked at it, is trade Bradley Beal and get picks. I agree that I would have traded Bradley Beal, but I can understand why they didn't. Because when you don't have anything, you don't really want to give up your best player. And you, I mean... I guess in their, I guess in their thing, in their minds, they probably still want to try to build around Bradley Bill because that's all you got. I was like, I don't think they want to just go back and blow it up to go to ground zero. I think they probably have faith that John Wall can probably come back and still be John Wall. You know, everybody else pans out, then you know. Uh, you know, we're back in contention now. But, I don't know, I think we just got to wait and see. I think everything right now for the Wizards is based on how good John Wall is when he comes back, for one. And if he's trash when he comes back, then I think at that point, I think he might just have to blow it up. Because now, you have a point guard who wants to still be point guard, but, you know, he's hurt. Well, he got hurt, and now he's not playing the same. So, I mean, you know, I don't know how your point guard can't bring a team if he's not playing the same as he was before. I think what it comes down to is the fact that is that the Wizards Wizards do not have a reliable front office, a structure in which I could trust them to rebuild. 
I get the idea and I understand that. So I don't want to come off as this delusional Wizards fan that's just like, la, 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 la. Tell me when John Wall comes back. But when it comes down to it, Beal is, like Tyler said, he's our only good player at the moment. And we can't, and our general manager is not even, who is not even really confirmed to be our general manager, but is. So he's almost like he's masquerading as a legit general manager because the way he's talking, it makes it sound like he's been like officially done as a general manager. But honestly, when it comes to Ted Leonsis' moves with the Wizards, I mean, he secretly extended Ernie Grunfeld last year. So maybe Tommy Shepard will be the general manager moving forward. They did some weird secret deal that we're never going to know about, and Tommy Shepard is just the guy. The problem is that the Wizards front office structure and the way that it, like the coaching, the, like not just the front office, but the coaching as well, they both do not make for a good environment for any picks to even flourish under John Wall did good because he was just good. Bradley Beal's doing good because he's just that damn good. The problem is now, like, you need to have, like, what the Pelicans have, where they were like, okay, we're just going to get David Griffin. We're going to, like, just re-up all this stuff. Because then, now we're excited about the Pelicans. Like, we're excited about Zion going to that instead of being Anthony Davis 2.0, where it's like, why the hell are they signing Omar Oshik to play with him? Why are they, like, trying to do a Twin Towers when the NBA is shifting? Like, I don't like some of the criticism that Davis gets beyond, like, the whole... The whole situation with Lakers, that was trash. But the thing about it is that the Pelicans restructured and said, okay, we messed up here, here, and here. Let's re- let's get some people that will not mess up here, here, and here and make it so that like Zion comes in and we're like, oh my God, this is great. Instead of, oh crap, are they going to waste his talents? I get the trade idea. I understand it. We would have to get LeBron like at least twice in this draft. So that's my only problem with the idea of trading deal is that I do not trust the structure to like, because every, and you and me were talking about this earlier. Wizards are one of those teams where we see a player and we're like, man, he'd be good if he was somewhere else. And then they go somewhere else. And what do they do? They freaking light it up. JaVale McGee got a ring. Otto Porter's making Chicago look smart for actually trading for him. While we have Parker, who we don't know is even going to come back. And Parker, I don't get paid to play defense. I don't want him. I don't want someone that literally said, I don't, I, I get paid to play offense. I don't get paid to play defense. Are you kidding me? You're a second round pick who's had like a bunch of injuries, which sucks and is unfair. And I don't think you deserve those injuries. No one does. But you had all these injuries, and the first thing you're saying when you're getting re- when you're getting signed to a rebuilding team that is looking for some type of veteran presence, and you have experience with struggling, you say, "I don't get paid to play defense." Get out of here, nah. Yeah, when it comes in with a trading deal, I understand it, but I feel like we should just stick it out because honestly, that's the best hope we got. Unless we hire an actual general manager that's legitimately competent, that has some history, that has some skills. Like, because we're not getting Masai Ujiri. I don't care how many times we'll just tweet during a championship. We're not getting <laughs> Masai Ujiri. Yeah. We need to get someone that's skilled and is able to actually structure this team, have a direction, and follow it. Until we do that, nah. So, with that being said, was there any surprises, any other disappointments in this draft that you guys found interesting beyond um, when we go into later? I mean, obviously, the uh, Suns picking Cameron Johnson at 11 was kind of a shock. It was just like, well, they reached really hard. Like, nobody, I don't think anybody else really had him on the draft board below, you know, above 20, I mean, below 20. That was pretty much a reach. But well, I was out of the top 10. The top 10 went pretty much at how I thought it was going to go, just looking through the draft. Because beyond, like, I feel like the obvious the obvious surprise was, like, Bull Bull dropping as far as he did, which we all were just like, well, you guys were just, like, freaking out. I was just like, well, he's injured, so I can, I can kind of see the rationale. I think it's kind of funny he ended up in Denver of all places just because now you have Michael Porter Jr. and then Bobo. Bo. And if they're both good, Jesus Christ, that team is going to be insane. Like, if they're legitimately good. Because then Nikola Jokic won't just have to worry about Murray getting destroyed on pick and rolls and being like, okay, I have no one else to pass to because the rest of my team is kind of iffy when it comes to shooting. Now I have Michael Porter Jr. People got to worry about Bobo. Bo. Just creating more defensive mismatches on the court for Denver would be insane. Like, can you imagine if they had a healthy Michael Porter and Bobo against the Blazers? Blazers would have got rocked. I mean, it was the most shocking one, obviously, of the night. I think besides the Cam Johnson one, I think the fact that the Cam Johnson one was so early definitely caught everybody's neck. Because, I mean, like, for me, I was shook. When they called it in, I didn't even know how to judge it. It's funny that Tyler puts him at 20, wasn't marked any, any wasn't mocked anywhere higher than 20. 20 was where I had him mocked to the 76ers at the time. I mean, you wonder whether or not J.J. Reddick's going to come back or whether or not you want to sign J.J. Reddick, you get the best shooter in the draft at 20. It makes you think, do I need to pay? Take a second look at do you need to pay J.J. Reddick that type of money to be a shooter 
who doesn't play defense very well when you can get a low first round talent that does similar things as him there's a few that I can come up off the dome just off the fact that it was just a crazy draft all the way around Nasir Little Nasir Little was a top five draft pick coming into the year easily I mean he I mean he was the Zion stopper coming out of the McDonald's All American game that was putting him on the map anywhere you could think of. I think it was either the I think it was either McDonald's or the Balls Life American game. Either way, after that game, that's where every that's where the hype really came from. To drop all the way to twenty five is insane. Now I think for Portland that's a steal because me personally, I'm sick of Al Farouk Aminu. I don't even know why this dude is like still making moves. He cannot shoot. He his his only he is literally what's the guy off um Oklahoma city that, that's hurt right now that everybody keeps talking about that Andre Roberson. he's literally the same person they're the same person again that's a little bit better than andre roberson though but the problem what where he where alfaro Camino produces better on offense there where it produces better on offense than him he's not better defender than andre roberson but andre roberson cannot shoot free throws so in the same inkling they are literally the same person so to be able to get somebody solidified at that three spot who can actually put the ball in the bucket is that's a dub like it's it's a it's a it's a shocking fall but of all teams for it to fall, that was definitely a fit. I think the Dylan Windler pickup, I don't know if you guys had a pick in the second round or not, bro, but if y'all did, the only thing that shocked me was the way that it happened. I mean, you guys were supposed to get Keldon Johnson, and they hit a remix real quick, like midway through the draft, and was like, wait, instead, we're going to get Dylan Windler. And I thought either way, you made out. I just think that early, late, however you look at it, I thought Kevin Porter would have been the, the, the bigger pick before Dylan Windler, considering you you, they were only a couple picks apart but getting Dil Dylan Windler period is a good pickup considering that he's like a wing player that shoots at a high clip and you I already know you guys are probably like over Kevin Love at this point just know you cannot trade him because for what you literally could probably trade him for a bag of chips with no dip at this point and somebody would probably be they you guys would probably be okay with it so I think that was a huge pickup I justify keeping Kevin Love is just so he can help develop the young players because Kevin Love is a great person to have in your locker room he, he's a great person in general. But can so, you I mean, develop somebody from without playing, though? Can you develop somebody without playing at the same time? That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, That's the only oh, yeah. issue. If you look at Ben Simmons, I mean, they kind people, the whole, and this is crazy because we're time traveling, but y'all remember when Ben Simmons was supposed to be rookie year and everybody was mad about it because, oh, he had a year of NBA experience. Right. It would feel kind of weird to, like, then say, like, you couldn't develop someone for a year because people are going to do it. With, if Michael Porter Jr. comes out here just destroying worlds, everybody's going to be like, well, it's not fair because, you know, and let's say someone else is the Donovan Mitchell of that year and they're like they're they were drafted the same year whatever and they're doing well are we gonna use the same argument then because i feel like when it comes to developing someone there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into it beyond just simply saying do a fade away this way or like and i'm not saying i'm not saying you're wrong i'm saying no, like, certain please. players the the best players that are good at developing or like are able to develop are the ones that like soak in all the knowledge and then apply it the, all i'm saying what I, i'm saying less about the players coming in and about it's harder to teach somebody from the bench i'm saying the person injured who is learning is soaking it up because they have basically nothing else to do i mean he was on that denver nuggets bench absorbing nba talent both from the bench and in the weight room obviously i'm saying the other way around is these are people coming into a system looking to learn from the guy who never gets up off the bench like that's like essentially somebody who's a second i mean that's somebody who's part of the second unit as like the ninth ten tenth guy on the roster trying to play mentor now kevin love is not the ninth 10th guy on the men on the on the roster but when you factor in how much he plays throughout the season that's essentially what it feels like in terms of who you're learning from you learn from a guy who can't stay on the court i think you guys coach change is going to do wonders because the young talent development thing you're taking it from a college perspective they're used to that the worst case scenario is you do it the um the pete carroll way from the from the, from the nfl how he did it with the seahawks they said he's like more of a college coach so he wasn't used to, you know, people when it came to contracts and stuff like that. Well, listen, you got seven years, about seven years of whatever rookies you pick up. You try to milk as much as you can, develop them as much as you can to be able to get as many wins as you can while they're on that rookie deal. And if they move on because they're trying to chase a bag, then you just get the new crop in and you try to develop them as much as you can to be able to win within the time frame you're working with. Because the same thing is in college. You're pressed for a year-to-year -year basis, and I guess he he's used to that to the point that, yes, the money
money and stuff is complicated to him, but he's not signing checks. So as long as he's bringing it, you guys are bringing in young talent. You brought in good young talent. Getting Kevin Porter at the very end of the draft is going to be huge if he, you know, is able to stay focused, which I'm, I guess is the biggest thing everybody was bringing up during that draft. I mean, I think I mean, you guys I, are set up. Ain't nothing to do in Cleveland from, according to Joe Kim Noah. There's nothing to do in Cleveland. Y'all are really going to take that press conference to heart. I swear everybody posts when he said that. He said that shit years ago because he hated LeBron. Nothing. We just we just finished talking about the people who got actually got drafted, but what about the people who didn't? Are there anybody who are free agents that you guys are excited to see most likely potentially get signed? Man, I'm I'm gonna try to stay as far away from a Wizards rant as I can, bro. But let me tell you, this man Lewis King, dude, I've been on this like since before the draft, probably like months before the draft. I thought I had him going to the Bulls with that pick later on in the draft, where they had got him in the second, where they had got Daniel Gafford in the second round. I never thought he was gonna be a first round talent because he didn't play enough games in college. But the fact that this man is still sitting on the shelf, but Bobo had injury risk with that that almost as significant. He he still got picked up in the second round. Granted, his fall was tremendous, which I understand. But, like, he still got picked up 44 to a perfect situation. I think if, I, if I'm if i taking my Bulls fandom out of it, it's still hard for me to take my two cents out of picking up Lewis King in terms of putting him on the Wizards. You just earlier were talking about we need wing help. We need center help bad. I want to tackle fall so bad. That's a whole nother thing, though. But the Wizards just need players, dude. Like people are not, people are not signed, and I'm, I cannot be confident in bringing Jabari, Jabari Parker back because he's going. They're going to want to start him, and I think that's going to stunt Rui's growth. And that's the last thing we need to be doing with a ninth overall pick. Being able to take Lewis King, we can put Lewis King at the at the two or the three Beal at this point. I, I, listen, I, like I said. I'll take Beal at the one over Thomas Sadoreski any day of the week. And that's not me trying to bash on this dude. But Beal is a very good ball handler as a primary decision maker. I'm not saying he's going to average seven assists. But it seems like every shooting guard you put into a point guard role can walk around and average seven assists. They just did it with Devin Booker last year. So it's not like you can't do these things. But Lewis King is definitely a huge one. I'm actually going to write an article later about like people that teams whiffed on. There's certain teams like the Wizards, for example, that I feel like didn't sign per certain people that have been perfect for systems taco fall fell into a very perfect area falling with the celtics they need a center super bad after trading aaron baines and now al forford's definitely chucking the peace on because they i heard even the mavericks want to throw money at him which is like insane because i mean i guess they need a center but not really with Kristaps coming in so the fact that they have money they're ready to blow on a veteran center like that you can tell he's definitely on his way out the door and then Shamori Pons is another one. If John Wall, I asked you earlier, is John Wall playing next year or is he hurt the whole year? And from everything I've seen, it seems like he's pretty much under the rug for next year too, whether we like it or not. So Shamori Pons would have been a perfect pickup. So him going, I think it was Houston, it was. So him going to Houston, that is like wasted potential to me. The same thing happened with, I think Trayvon Duvall was the player in last year's draft who was um, Duke's point guard and Houston scooped him up too. And I think he's like, he's either at the end of the bench or he's definitely G League in it right now. But like, that's just another point guard. Houston's going to sweep under the rug. That would have been perfect for somebody like the Wizards to scoop up right now, considering the influx of situations. With our cap hell, undrafted free agents, and second round picks, we need to like snag all of them. So the fact that we only grabbed one, and I don't even, I'm not even gonna go back and check his name, because that's how uninterested I am in the person we did pick. Like, Emerald man. Emerald. No, no, no. We, remember, we traded for him. I'm talking about, I think we, tra- there was somebody we had picked up, For-ish. Justin Robinson from Virgin, from Virginia Tech. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I know who. Justin Robinson is. I'm not saying we have to take big names, but I mean even the son signed Jalen Leck out of high school, who I would have been perfectly fine with as a as a guard who just needs to play. He's like hyper athletic. He gives a huge boost off the bench if you're going to bring him in as a bench guard if you really want Thomas Sadoreski to play that bad that's perfectly fine he could be a bouncy dude off the off the bench that can get the team hype when you see somebody go up for a dunk Zion's going to do the same thing I'm not saying Jalen Leck and Zion are the same person 
But when somebody gets bouncy and, you know, does some insane things with the ball in open court, it gets the whole team running. It gets, it gets the whole team in a flow. And even that would have been a perfect player to pick up. So him landing his sons, that's a good pick on their end because they need one. But, I mean, it's so many people that, like I said, I'm trying not to be in a Wizards rant too because I'm over here beating it up when it comes to how bad the Wizards are at running their front office right now. But, I mean, we talking about free players. These are free. These are essentially free people. I'm going to leave that one alone, Pastor. That. The people I got had a couple. So I can, see, I can see him looking some of them up too. I peeped it in the corner. I'm like, oh snap, he about to go in. I seen him typing. I said, oh, no, he's about, he about to really go in. No, All right, so win. literally almost immediately after the draft, you had the OKC Thunder pick up Luke and Store, who should have been like a early second round pick. And yes. uh, under, really, I don't know why. He averaged, like, I think, like, what, 16, 17 points a game? Pretty good score on a pretty crappy team. But, I mean, he shouldn't have won undrafted. I know that. So, I mean, I like that pickup by them because they definitely needed some extra score off the bench. Then I like Chris Wilkes going to New York because you pair somebody like RJ with somebody who's just going to be slamming it down with Mitchell and Kevin Knox and Dennis Smith Jr. And, I mean, if they keep DeAndre Jordan, we're talking about Lob City or just Slam City or whatever because these are full of guys, all guys that can just throw it down with the best of them. Then you had to do Brian Bowen that came from overseas. He was pretty good in high school and originally was going to Louisville, but then I think a lot of Louisville drama happened and he ended up leaving. Yeah, I think it was the scandal thing that got the coach in trouble. Yeah, so then he just ended up leaving and going to Australia and played. And he uh, got picked up by Indiana as a season four. So, I mean, if you can come out off the bench and just knock down some shots for them, because I think, aren't they getting ready to lose Bogdan or Bohan Bogdanovich? I think? They have to pay him a lot of money. I don't know if they I think they're going to match anybody that tries to put up that, uh, those four years for him, because, I mean, he can't sign any more than a four-year deal. They obviously aren't going to max him out, but he's going to get paid no matter who ends up he ends up signing with period so yeah I mean, if, they don't, if, they don't, if they don't i think if brian bowen pans out he might be a good replacement like i don't know i guess it's, i like marquise bowen from the Cavs. i don't know that he'll be that much different from tristan thompson but he'll be cheaper than tristan thompson because mm -hmm. tristan thompson go and lay a egg somewhere else in somebody else's city because I'm tired of mm -hmm. I like Nas Reed over in LSU. He just got yes, the Yes, my boy. Like a nice backup. Just somebody that's going to get out there, get rebounds, and put it back up. Down for me. And who else? Derek Norville from the Gonzaga going to the Lakers. Just another decent pickup for them. Somebody literally just to play basketball for them for sheep. I mean, honestly, if the Lakers just pick, pick up some pretty decent guys on their team, I think they'll be fine. Hold up, Tyler, real quick, bro. You had somebody, you guys picked up somebody undrafted last year that I was watching in high school. What, y'all still... Y'all still stashing Billy Preston? Where's my guy at? Is, okay, he, is he coming up from? Is he coming up from the G League or not, bro? That's my guy. I, I, I like Billy Preston too because he's from my. He's from my yeah, that's, bro. From, that's my guy. When I saw that pickup as an undrafted free agent last year, I thought it was the, the unsung signing of the year on the low key, but then I saw he wasn't getting any playing time. He's currently on the Texas Legends right now. Jeez. Actually, we have another signee in the books, bro. Billy Preston is no joke. It's the Wizards. We're probably not going to get him. We're probably not, but I'm trying to tell you, bro. The man's a bucket. I'm telling you. On the side, look into that. Anybody watching this, look into that. I'm telling you right now. It's a bucket. It's, it's yeah, a bucket. Was, I don't know if he just didn't play a lot, but I mean, out of 27 games played, he only averaged 7 points at 17 minutes, shooting 38% from the field and 36% from 3.1. And they didn't they really do much any other way. Um, they may, Maybe they just yanking his confidence or something, bro. Because I'm telling you, if you take if he got to play on Kansas and uh, the big stage before all the uh, the money stuff and everything like that got in trouble with the the car and everything, if he had gotten past that and got to play on the Kansas big stage, he definitely would not have went undrafted. So I think that was like a huge steal. He just has to get his potential realized. But I think that's just another situation where having a college coach like the one you guys have coming out of Michigan, like I don't know if he's gonna get noticed, but if he can, that's another that's another huge guy that you know through high school was a bucket. So. I, I felt like that made sense. I'm noticing a lot of Gonzaga players are getting picked up after the draft. Like, there's been like at least three that have been picked up. Like you said, they don't make really good. They haven't really developed a lot of good pro players, but they always do really well in the, in the college. To top it off, the last few I was going to say was, I like Lindell Wigginton over in the, from Iowa State going to Toronto. He's a little bigger. He's like 6'2", 190 going over there. To, so he can definitely back up the two-point guards they have over there. And Kyle Lowry and I can't think of 
his name right now. Van but, Vliet. Uh, yeah. Vliet. Yeah. Go, he definitely plays more defense than those two do. I'll tell you that. Wiggins no joke. Then you got Okaya Brissett from Syracuse going to the Clippers as a four. I like him as well. Uh, I don't know how he'll really fit on there, but I think he might just, you know, he, I think he's one of the players that can pretty much fit in almost any system. He doesn't really do any one thing overly great. And then obviously, you got Taco Fall going to Boston. <laughs> It was like, he's going to be playing Perfect. with Grant yeah. Williams, Jason Tatum, uh, Carson Edwards, and Romeo Langford over there. And then you still, we got, if you're going with the bench, you got Marcus Smart over there, Tremont Waters over there. They're going to have a fun team to watch next year. I was like, when I'm ready for this summer league to start to see how Taco Fall does in the summer league. <laughs> yeah, summer league is going to be live. That's what, two weeks from now? That's going to be... Summer league gonna be more different this year than ever because so many so many teams have more than one pick, so it's gonna be a lot more guys to be looking for than just than normal. You know, it's always just first and second year players. So I mean, it's a lot of people that's gonna be able to get some time to shine. I think it's plenty of teams that we should be watching too. Those teams that have multiple picks, whether the players are starting on those teams or not, I think it's gonna be huge to see what they do in summer league just because of like you know meshing that talent together. But it's gonna be live in terms of for, uh, undrafted free agents. I mean, it don't get any bigger than Lewis King right now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm telling y'all. I'm telling you, bro. I'm going to be on that until he gets signed. I've refreshed my phone every two hours to see if this man, but I've literally searched this man's name up and then just refreshed the page. Until something happened, nah, I will get a Lewis King jersey and wear it on the net, on the video as soon as he's done. I don't care. It's that deep. So we have gone through our surprises, our disappointments, our winners, our losers of the NBA draft, and our free agent rookies it's time for the thing that everyone else is super excited for and frankly i have a little bit more knowledge on uh free agency free agency oh sweet dear free agency how you call me and have me freak out when someone signs to a different franchise let's talk about a uh, free agency after i said it 17 times i'm gonna piece that out since you and one that ain't really talk so far Damn. I mean, I, mean, I, I, don't don't think think that, I don't think that was a road no. action. I mean, you, was, you were putting a, you were putting a I bad spot. I said I don't know nothing in the beginning was, of the video. What happened was, when we got off the podcast, immediately the Al Horford and Harrison Barnes news broke. And it was like, okay, Harrison Barnes were like, meh. And then some people joked that he might go back to the Warriors, which would just be funny. As far as Al Horford leaving, that really puts a bigger hole on the Celtics because now it's just like, dang. And then low-key, I forgot to mention it during the draft talk, but they actually traded Aaron Baines, and apparently Aaron Baines opted in after having discussed with them, like, hey, I understand you guys want to move me, and I want to be here, but if you do move me, move me to a contender. And they were like, all right, we got you, homie. Send him to the Suns. For some reason. So he's probably going to do a buyout there. I thought that was a little bit interesting. That the Celtics seem to have, unfortunately, put themselves in this position where players don't want to be there because they'll be viewed as assets. Now, this was a bit of a low-key story when it came to Houston, like a little bit back in the day, because there was that weird little, um, there was that weird little quote that came out of, um, Dwight, Dwight and... James Harden, when they were first playing together, and James kind of said, like, everybody knows, like, we're the top dogs or something like that, and it seems as though he was alienating the rest of the players, but in this situation, it seems as though Boston, unfortunately, is alienating the potential free agents by sort of not really taking care of their guys. I'm not saying you got to do it with every single guy. The Isaiah Thomas thing, as much as people want to like try and conflate that with Anthony Davis, Anthony Davis and Isaiah Thomas's level of talent are are not the same. Not Unfortunately, either. the emotional aspect of what happened with Isaiah Thomas is what made that such an impactful trade for everyone. And so now with Kyrie pretty much destroying the entire chess set that Danny Ainge supposedly had and Al Horford pretty much being like, all right, I'm looking at this wreckage and I'm looking at that shiny house over there that's not in Boston, and I'll see you later. Now Boston pretty much just kind of did a, is now doing sort of a pseudo rebuild, and I only say pseudo due to the fact that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are still there. Terry Rozier, I mean, he's hit or miss, but you still have Marcus Smart who has actually improved his three-point shot to the point that if you play 2K, you can't get mad at him making threes when he's open every now and again. He can't be hitting him like Steph Curry, but if he, but if you leave him open, there's a there's a 50-50 chance he might make it. So with that being said, the Boston Celtics are thrust into a rebuild. I'm not sure where Harrison Barnes goes. I, I don't know where he's going to go. As far as the Kyrie to Nets idea, the reason I'm kind of interested in it is because we just saw Kyrie quite literally nuclear bomb an entire franchise that seemed unflappable at times and seemed as though it was really on the right track. Everybody's been talking about how, man, Boston has the best rebuild. They're going to win 
in 60 games, and then pretty much the unpredictable, which is literally how sports works. We never see it coming. Raptors beating the Warriors, we don't see this type of stuff coming. They now have a team that's pretty much going to have to deal with that. When it comes to Kyrie torpedoing a team, the Nets apparently are a little bit skittish about signing him. I'm not really sure as to what they're going to do, because on one end, you take Russell, you take Russell back, and you say, all right, we're going to stick with this young team because they have really good chemistry and everybody gets along and we just saw Kyrie destroy a young team. Or you say we take Kyrie because we want to continue advancing on the ledger of NBA teams. We want to be a part of the hierarchy. We want to be at the top. So that means getting the stars because if you get Kyrie and Kyrie's willing to go, well, then maybe somebody else will come down, which again gets into a weird kind of debate about, well, if he went to Boston, but he technically didn't, he just got traded there and he wasn't, I don't think it was on one of his destinations. Along with the fact that the Brooklyn Nets have that weird little debate, if Kyrie is to go to Brooklyn, we are to assume that hopefully he doesn't torpedo that team too, but then D'Angelo Russell destinations get a little interesting because Utah's out of the running now, but Indiana, who apparently is going to go for Ricky Rubio and honestly, that's just really disappointing because y'all literally just went through a whole season, well, not a whole season, but y'all went through half a season without offense because you're two centers, and this goes into the Gogo Bidadze thing, and this is why I don't think it's necessarily a bad move. Indiana Pacers signing Ricky Rubio as a non-shooter is worse than um, Gogo Bidadze because they have no idea if they're going to actually pay DeMontis Sabonis or if they're going to keep both Miles Turner and DeMontis Sabonis. Because Miles Turner is apparently really inconsistent, but DeMontis Sabonis is a really good off-the-bench piece, but they're not apparently good enough to really warrant starting positions. So, it turns into this weird thing, but now Gogo Bidatse kind of gives a clear indication that Indiana is going to move on from one of them. We don't know who, but they're going to move on from one of them. So, D'Angelo Russell going there would be way better. I think Ricky Rubio going to the Pacers would just kind of make them, like, he's a really good passer, and he unlocks an offense in a very unique way, but in the playoffs, we literally saw Utah just dying for any offense that wasn't named Donovan Mitchell. So I think maybe the Magic get in on it. Maybe Pacers should change their mind. Other teams going for Russell would be interesting. I don't want to hear about, oh my god, what if Russell went back to the Lakers? Ha, ah, memes, no. That, that's pretty much what I got to say on free agency. I think I literally just talked for like three, four minutes straight, so I'm going to shut up again. <laughs> oh, my breath. Wait, <laughs> Like, like I said, I mean, right now, like you said, the Nets don't know if they're going to go with Kyrie if they don't get KD. But my thing about Kyrie is everybody's trying to put the blame on the Celtics on Kyrie. And I don't think that's it. Well, no, I don't want to say that. So, like, let me clarify is that I'm not saying Kyrie destroyed the entire team. Kyrie had a big hand in the team's downfall. Yeah. I mean, you added a star to a good team that was full of potential stars. And you try to share the ball with that many players that are potential stars and trying to find their way. And he's trying to get his shots. But Kyrie's a known person that just likes to get his shots. So, I mean, all of that factoring into each other will lead up to a point where we're at now where it's just like, all right, you know, I don't know where we go from here. We're into Brooklyn. Brooklyn is more of an unselfish kind of environment. Like, they're more of a brotherhood. They're more together. Everybody knows their roles. Every, nobody's just like, ego is really getting in the way of anybody else's ego. So, I mean, which is what I thought was a problem in Boston. It was a lot of ego. Like Jason Tatum, oh, I'm strapped now. I, I did this in playoffs. Kobe out here training me. It's my team now. Terry Rozier, oh, I did good playoffs. I think I'm ready to start when you probably in reality just like old boy over there in Detroit who thought he was a starter. Now look at Reggie Jackson. Jackson. <laughs> Are yeah. you saying Terry Rozier? Reggie Jackson? Hey, Reggie Jackson? I, I think so. That's I, think a, he, a I think he might have something to say with that one. Yeah. I mean, I think though, before we go further, I think though, Boston making the play playoffs and going as far as they did is what allowed those players to think like that because if Kyrie was healthy the first year we might be talking about a completely different scenario look what I'm saying I was like if Kyrie was healthy throughout the playoffs this, this might be different and you know if we came to the same result this year and we still had Kyrie we'd be talking about something else and that's pretty much my thing with Kyrie is like, I don't think I don't I would say oh you know off that one thing he's a bad leader I'm like I don't think he's a bad leader but I don't think he's a leader I just don't think he's a bad leader because of that situation but then at the same time and that, like you said, we also have Al Horford going into free agency, possibly. I don't see Al Horford as a ring chaser. He could always take a pay cut and go to L.A. as an option. I mean, I prefer not to see that. But at the end of the day, it's, it is the option. I don't know. I mean, I haven't really, uh, after the draft, I haven't really focused too much on free agency and where people are going, especially after KD and Claire getting both getting hurt. If I'm KD, I'm signing my $30 million option 
coming back next year and seeing what teams are. Because if I, I don't want to put, I don't. I, there's no point, you know. I mean, although I can get a max deal, I don't want to just be in Golden State after that if I don't really want to be there. Then I was like, is it, if I can just go into free agency next year and then see, all right, you know, RJ's over here doing good in New York, or Kyrie's killing it in Brooklyn and could use a second star. Then I'm making my decision off of that as opposed to trying to make a decision just based off of this year. You haven't really seen how these players are going to pan out, how these teams are going to pan out. Which you the word is going to be a safe bet, but I mean, I don't know if he wants to do that or not. I mean, I, I completely agree. I said it in the last podcast, too. Like, if I was him, I mean, I feel like regardless, my plan was always the same, injured or not injured. I said it in the last podcast, keep it consistent. You pick up the option, you exercise the $30 million that you're owed, you go get a ring. Assuming he was playing, it was go get a ring. Now, it's you rehab under somebody else's payroll without it affecting your years eligible in the league. When you sign a five-year deal, and I I've heard all this stuff this week about oh he could sign a five year deal he could sign sign for the max with the lake with the with the Warriors sorry he could sign with the max with the Warriors and they could do a delayed trade but who in their right mind would trust the organization with trading you to where you want to go when you want to go there as doing a solid like this mm-hmm. is a, this is a life situation like with anybody you're gonna put the trust in somebody else's hands to make the decision of where you end up. Up? No way. Did you mean like a sign and trade, sort of similar to the Chris yeah. thing? Where so a sign and trade, it wouldn't necessarily be like that because Chris Paul did the same thing, where he told the Clippers, "Hey, I'm gonna leave to the Rockets, but I'll let you trade with them if you want to, so that way y'all get something back." Versus he could have just not said anything at all and just like signed with them and left. Again, it's still like, why would you do that anyway? Just because you can just leave and not give them anything to be competitive? Because Golden State was able to do a sign and trade. I, I I don't not have the belief that Golden State would be able to finagle some things away from whatever team they're trading with. I mean, but, if it's the Knicks, you they're already watered down and you want to trade more away. Part of the whole thing, people were comparing it similar to like the, the biggest example of seeing a trade for a superstar fall out, the exact opposite of an Anthony David tra- Davis trade is the Carmelo Anthony trade. Carmelo couldn't wait a year to be able to go to the team under the cap that he would have been able to get and in terms ended up souping up the Nuggets team by getting Danilo Gallinari and all of them over there. In turns, watered down the Knicks, which made the Knicks not very competitive competitive going over there. If the Knicks have an exact same, you know, replay of that with KD coming off of an injury, you're looking, you're looking real bad no matter what their circumstances are as a GM. So I just don't, and I think for him, like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, dude, you already don't know if you could, could have fully trust, trusted them when it came to the injury in the first place of how it all happened. But then you put on top of that that now you're going to have to trust that they will trade the team that you want to be traded to. So, what? Tyler is an idiot, dog. Because no. he put his chin on the keyboard. It was just like... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and what made it funny was that you didn't notice because you were looking away. Oh, oh God, Tyler, you're an idiot! I swear, to God. For me, it looks like my head is just cut off. It looks like I can all I can see. Is yeah, no, no. no can... What makes it funnier is that the angle makes it horrible because you either way too damn close or you cut off. <laughs> Chris like... Paul Rockets uh, drama. Well, okay, so what we have now, as a, as far as I know, there was a fake man boob story, which I didn't even know about. Like that, apparently, um, some people on the uh, ESPNs apparently silly, like hilariously talked about as if it was a real story. Chris Paul has gone out and said that this is. He's like, oh, that's news to me. He's kind of denounced it. We haven't, I don't think James Harden said anything though. And Daryl Morey has also basically said the story is not, not going to happen. Chris Paul is going to stay a rocket. Do you guys think that there is credence to what they're saying? Or do you think that they are playing the sort of con of saying, oh, nothing's going on. But like, it's literally just like fire in the background. And since no one's seemingly taking Paul they're kind of just using the idea that no one's taking Paul and just feeding into it by saying, well, actually, we want him here and he's going to stay here because they couldn't find anyone. Two weeks ago, they wanted to blow the team up. That was, okay, so the whole man move thing was actually, somebody, yeah, it was funny because somebody tweeted it out and was like, yeah, Chris Paul said something about James Harden's man moves and he left, well, he left the dude <laughs> crying. And then Skip from Undisputed on FS1, not ESPN, oh, okay. said that said that on the show. And it was supposed to, it was a fake tweet. It was clearly fake. And it was just like, everybody was just laughing at it because it was like, you really just going to sit up here and just say anything now. That's, you just say anything. 
So it didn't, even, it didn't even sound believable. It wasn't from a reputable source. It was from Twitter. Uh, uh, all that aside, I think I think Chris Paul and I think they're gonna stay hold it to hold it down. If they do make a trade, it's not gonna be to the trade deadline. Only because they wanna try to force this thing to work. And if it just truly doesn't work, I think they just wait to the trade deadline or do it in the off season. Just because I mean, you all you'll know if you're gonna just be in a, be in for a long year once the season starts. If you can look past look past you know everything going on, then it is what it is, and you just forget to pass and go forward. But then another reason you might want to pick Chris Paul, because like we just said, he just, they just signed Shamori Punk. If Chris Paul can like help develop the rookie behind him, coming behind him, and then that rookie comes and plays with James Harden, and he's a better version of what Chris Paul is now, then you know it's a win-win for the Rockets at the end of the day, even if you lose Chris Paul for nothing. If I'm a team, why am I trading for Chris Paul? Because that, that contract is just too much. You don't. No, that's, the problem. Problem. that's the problem. That's the problem. Like, you can't trade him. So it's like, if they wanted to trade him, I think then we wouldn't have these, like, very intense, um, seemingly not deliberate, but, like, very intense, no, this isn't happening. Instead, it's more like, well, we might. Because, like, when it comes to, like, Daryl Moore and the Rockets, they've kind of had this real big hard-on for just destroying the Warriors. they just been like, yeah, man, we totally beat the Warriors and, like, the rest of the conference. And I'm going to pull up the tweet because I just thought it was the dumbest thing ever. And not along with the whole MVP thing. He was like, they were, they've been so focused on destroying the Warriors. And then the Warriors beat them again. Just destroy them emotionally at this point. Because, like, you, you had a chance. KD went down. And I always wanted the Warriors. Personally, I wanted the Warriors dynasty who was going to end. I wanted them to get beaten fair and square. Like, all, like, healthy. Because that would have just made it way sweeter. But, nah. You talk about how you're the only team that can really beat the Warriors. The Warriors beat you. And then you, not only that, but you had that whole stupid audit for like all the missed calls of last year still lost this year still and then watch the Raptors do what you couldn't do so you look even stupider I don't know why I'm going so hard on them right now but you look even stupider and then on top of that now your point guard might want out might not People are saying that you and you can't even get rid of him because you signed him to a crap ton because he, he he got injured at the worst time, but it really illustrated his value. And now you're like, oh my god, we're gonna keep him, but he's too old. What do we do? As far as the Rockets go, they can't even trade him. They're kind of almost in, I guess, no man's land. If people, if, if you trust people, because people think Clint Capella's trash now because he got he got outworked the way he outworked Carl Anthony Towns that one year when they made the playoffs. Jimmy Butler, Tobias Harris, where do you think? they will end up because the Sixers have a low-key interesting situation and I think no one's really like people harped on it during the season and after they lost in the playoffs but now we're like a few days away from like stuff going down do you think Butler and Harris stay do you think the Sixers should keep them considering the way that Ben Simmons if Ben Simmons could shoot that would change so much now Butler and Harris they they went all in for them do they keep those guys should they keep those guys I think you keep one, not both. I mean, Tobias Harris is the one who falls out of the mix. Even in the, I mean, even in the playoffs throughout the season, when he was when he was picked up from the trade, bad trade by the way. Sam, it's a shooter. Just telling you, the Clippers, they they're moving on with a good little backcourt with Sam and uh, Alexander. I mean, because you have to think about this past this year. You got Ben. Ben is coming up and shoot no shoot. I mean, unless he just wants to dip. Most times off of a rookie deal, most rookies pick up their option that ends up getting them closer to like six, seven years. That's how Anthony Davis got put in the situation he got put in because it's the most likely situation. You're not going to come off of your rookie deal and just start testing free agency. I guess Ben Simmons is a high caliber enough player even without the ability to shoot at a high clip or at a even decent clip that's, i think that's the biggest thing is they can't just look at it from just this year i think yeah you can go over the luxury tax to be able to sign both of them but tobias's game i mean dude's a purebred mm-hmm. shooter and i definitely think he should be more of a second option than anything else so putting somebody in a situation where they have to be the fourth option you essentially you essentially are paying somebody because he's not going to just take some pay cut and you can't pay somebody a damn near the max to be a fourth option. It sounds silly. It's a really dumb way to blow your salary cap when you could just fill out the roster a better way. I think the 76ers should be more worried about whether or not they're going to be able to retain Reddick or not, considering the circumstances of shooters just you know, not growing on trees, obviously. So, I mean, that's their biggest thing is that. I mean, the whole thing with Butler is, I mean, if all this crap about him going to the Lakers is real, then I think he already found himself in a crapshoot because I don't know how he fits on that team because you can say he's a wing defender all you want to and they do need guards 
more than anything. But, I mean, I don't see it. I think he wants to go. I think they, they keep talking about this stuff with him going to Houston, but I don't know how they can pay him. So, I mean, unless they're cool with going over to luxury tax, which, I mean, is cool. But they keep talking about him going over there. I don't know who you can dump to make that type of salary space. Jimmy Butler is a mystery. I think Tobias is going to go wherever the bag is. Insert team here type of thing. Like, I mean, because he just does not fit on this team as constructed. And if he turns into a fourth option again, you're paying a lot of money for a fourth option. Which for him, I mean, I could kick back and throw my feet up or average 12 and get paid like that. But, I mean, that can't be it. I, I know th Tobias is another one of those underrated players like Giannis that doesn't have the flash, but he has improved every single year and just has not gotten any dap on it. If you look at his improvements from shooting from the floor, points, rebounds, assists, the whole nine, he's improved every year since even being on the Magic beforehand and the Pistons, I think, before that. He got traded from the Magic to the Pistons to the Clippers now. Yeah. Yeah, and so I traded to the Sixers. So now yeah. he'll find so, out his own. Yeah, I mean, regardless if you, I mean, regardless, just looking into it, I mean, he's improved every single year. So to think that he would want to be okay with relegating himself to or delegating himself to being the third or fourth op, fourth option, the money is there, yeah, but he just doesn't seem like that type. He's obviously trying to improve for a reason, which you don't see out of most basketball players, a la Andrew Wiggins. If you're good enough to be good enough, then you kind of just stick with your five-year max and, and kind of just continue putting up 22 points and not doing anything better than that. Or you could be him who's improved every single year and it's putting himself in a position where people are putting him in the same graphic as the, the Ks who are free agents because you're a top-tier free agent as well, which is what's been up there with him and Al Horford and them also being added up there. So, I mean, the Sixers have a lot of soul-searching to do in terms of where they want to go because they're still a young squad. So, I mean, they and they got a lot of money to play with. I mean, well, not a ton, but they de if they're willing to go into luxury tax, then they definitely have more than enough money to play with. Have you ever been hearing about this whole trading DeMar DeRozan thing? Going From right the now? Spurs? Oh, yeah. But I thought that was going to happen draft night if it was going to go down. That's my only yeah. thing. But, I mean, it seems like it could be an offseason. <clears throat> what do y'all think? Well, I just wanted to get y'all thoughts on that. To huh. where? <laughs> well, to where? To where? I mean, Damn. I don't have any crazy reactions to that idea just out of the fact that it, I, it's been on the rumor mill for a minute. I mean, I think surprising enough, and I didn't even realize this until earlier today because he wasn't really like notable. No, he wasn't notable as a free agent, but it has to do with whatever they decide to do with Lamarcus Aldridge. Whether they move him or not, they have wings for days now. I mean, Lonnie Walker got injured last year. Um, the point guard, DeJounte Murray. But yeah, DeJounte Murray was this let this past season was supposed to be his breakout season. So, I mean, I know he's a guard, but like still, Derek White is one though when you put that whole thing out there. Um, I mean, they just drafted a, a, a wing, yeah. crying out loud. When Derry's freaking Longhorn. Who? When Derry Wingington. I know he had the weirdest name ever. Wait. Wait. Was Wiggins? Quindarius Quindarius Thornwell? What? Who was? I don't know who you're talking about. They got Keldon Johnson. That's who I was trying to who remember. Who signed Quindary Leggington or whatever? He did. He, they signed, they got, they drafted Quindary Weatherspoon. There it is. That's <laughs> in the second round, but either way, yeah. <laughs> Ashton, I'm pretty sure you literally only brought his name up because his name is hilarious. Because there ain't no way you thought he was really competing for a spot, bro. Come on now. You, Lucas Sem Seminet? Seminet? Yeah, but I think he's not. I think he might not come yeah, over. Lucas Sem Sem I, think I think he might he not come over. been a stashing draft. Yeah, so he I might not come over if the, if the Lamarcus Aldridge thing doesn't go well. But mean, in terms of re signing him. I don't mean to just, just, just rebuild back to the Blazers. He'd be the most, man, don't even give me stuff. He, that would be the most trash move ever. You thought you was going to get more clout. Now, Dame has hit the two biggest shots in history that's not Kyrie's shot or not Ray Allen's shot at this point. So, I mean, you think you're going to come back and get clout now when you were salty about not having any clout beforehand? Nah, if he turned back around and go do that, I think the biggest people, I think the biggest players nobody is talking about is the fact that the Mavericks still have money after they sign Kristaps, bro. The Mavericks, they looking like the move. I don't know if they trying to build a full Euro team or what, but if they with that, I'm with it too. Because they should go out and go sign Bondadovich. They should go see if they can look and get the guard and Dragic. I think they should just make a full Euro team and go crazy. I'm just saying. I know Vucevic is a um, free agent too. That's both. 
crazy. I'm telling you, if they want to go full Euro team, bro, they would be nice because there's Euro dudes on the books that they could go ahead and get. And the fact that they have Luca and Porzingis already kind of like in place, I don't even think. I mean, yeah, it's a little wild. Like, yeah, we're just gonna have a full European squad, but like everybody that they would be signing brings a skill that translates to a winning basketball team. Yeah, because people are saying that Dallas is not necessarily looking to sign Al Horford to anything. Like, they're kind of just being like, eh, we, or no, not to anything, but they don't want to sign him for the full, they don't want to sign him for the full, like, four years. Who like, would? His age doesn't warrant it, at least not for them. Defense, their timeline is different. Yeah, their timeline is different, and I think, because I saw, like, one guy, like, kind of criticizing. They were like, Dallas shouldn't be picky about who they get, and I'm like, well, I mean, they're in a weird spot because they're young, but they're about to rise if everything falls right. If things do not fall right, he's sort of insurance, but again, you don't need a veteran presence anymore because these guys are like, okay, well, maybe Chris Tapps. Somebody just needs to watch Chris Tapps because apparently he was fighting Russian dudes across the universe and then he came back and like had these allegations. I'm not going to indict him. Whoever, yeah. If evidence yeah. and whatnot yeah. is presented to yeah. indict him, That's then... That's not what we do on the channel, bro. <laughs> Not legal like, enough. Like, that. yeah, yeah, there's just been too much, like, off the court stuff with him that hopefully does not bleed into the court. So, yeah, Dallas could maybe sign Al Horford or Al Horford. I mean, because where else would Al Horford go? Now that we're thinking about it, I don't know where Al Horford would go, to be honest. Al Horford just seems like a player that's just like a I'll take a pay cut kind of guy. So, but I mean, that just opens up. Like, I don't sound like that's what he wants. Yeah, it don't sound like what he wants. It sounds like he wants a ring. Like, he might just want to get a ring before he retires. There's so, I mean, no that's on LA. the Lakers. I mean, I know, I know. It seems like I'm hating on the Lakers, but low key, like I just feel like with the way that that cap, like we have to see what happens with that cap first. Second off, that would if they get three guys, because everybody's already giving them the title. I'm not saying you, y'all are. I'm not saying like anybody watching this is. I'm just saying like certain like media structures have been like Lakers gonna get the title most likely. People are gonna try to go over the chip. I'm just like, but y'all need a team outside of those two because it's like freaking basic basketball we literally watched the Warriors play body Jenga and they broke down and they lost to Kawhi who was on basically one leg because like they had a deeper team because everybody says well depth doesn't matter in the playoffs and then everybody gets injured and they're like oh man you should have depth so somebody make up their mind because for me I don't see LeBron and Anthony Davis just running rampant throughout the uh, the West especially when the West is usually full of teams that have a lot of players and a lot of body for the regular season and can survive all of it. It's just like, when it comes to the Lakers championship chances, there has to be a team beyond those two players because if there's not, you're not winning. That's the question. I have an Milwaukee, what? There's a lot of free agents in Milwaukee right now. Oh, you can't oh, all of them money too. Malcolm Brogdon, yeah. Chris Middleton, Mm-hmm. George Hill mm-hmm. and then Miritich is the last one that's a lot of yeah. bodies dude so I, mean, I know I know Malcolm Brock and I, I, don't, I think he'll want money I don't know <laughs> he <laughs> definitely he definitely he definitely warrants a contract like that's pretty significant but. Chris Middleton definitely wants some money so I mean are you paying are, are you paying Chris Mid- who, who are you paying in this situation if you can't get them all this is like a Sixers question because it's sort of the same sort of dilemma where it's like we what? pay one guy no, no, because, okay. no, 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 no. It's definitely not that complicated. I think it is. If you have to pick, you're not bringing Brook Lopez back and you don't bring Miritich back. Miritich literally did not contribute to your team and was more about an on-paper lineup. He was one of those guys that was inserted into the lineup as an on-paper guy that is like, oh, we just brought a stretch four to the lineup and that was never consistent. And then you talk about Brook Lopez. I thought that was a huge signing, period. He has one more deal left. That he wants. It's not going to be the Lakers because people think he's going back to the Lakers. I don't no, he's not. Help it. No, he's not. People are like, oh, because people said LA is looking at Brooke Lopez and DeAndre Jordan, <laughs> which I said probably not going to get DeAndre Jordan. They will. They are more likely to get DeAndre Jordan than get Brooke Lopez, bro. Uh, Brooke Lopez has a stretch the floor type of game that transits it to a point more money. That it translates to him being able to warrant more money from somebody, especially a team in need of a big that can shoot. And 
that can also still stay in front of the rim. Hey, Ashton, doesn't that sound very familiar at the moment of a team that probably needs a big that can stay in front of the rim and actually shoot? But, you know, that's none of my business. Actually, it is. But that's we're going to move away from that. I think that they're similar. I think the situations are similar because of how well the teams did. And if you maybe you give that Tobias Harris and Jimmy Butler experiment more time, it could flourish. Like, Harris could become like, oh, crap. Like, it could feel like we're playing against a Warriors that's big instead of again that would be that would mean that Ben Simmons has a jump shot that you would have to guard that's like outside of 10 feet or outside of literally front of the rim but I feel like it's similar maybe I shouldn't have said exact same but it's similar because of how those players contributed to the winning situations maybe Nikola Mirotic is not a Tobias Harris clone but they're still like if if, if Milwaukee does not sign if, does, if Milwaukee does not get back Brook Lopez who in the hell are they going for that has the who, like because he was Flash Mountain. I would make sure I get Malcolm and Brooke out of anybody. Everybody else can pretty much step. I mean, Chris Middleton, if you can afford to get him, yes, but I think he's going to cost too much, and I don't think he's worth losing either Malcolm or Brooke at really? the end of the day. I don't think Chris Middleton is going to be good, like, as good as he was this year or any other year. I think that was his peak year, to be honest. I mean, on other teams, he was a height, and I don't think yeah. he's going, I don't think he's going anywhere else that's just going to be, like, crazy good. I, if, I'm, if I'm Chris Middleton, I'm going to bag at this point, because I'm at the peak of my career. I'm thinking, logically, I don't have either too many more years of being at this peak of my career. Either I stay and just take a little pay cut, but still get the most money out of everybody on the team, or I step to the side and just go ahead and sign the bag somewhere else and get my money while I can, while I'm good, and ride it out somewhere else. I mean, if I had to pick, I'm picking Malcolm and Brooke. And just going with that, because I mean, at least Malcolm, Malcolm's consistent. He, he's the he's the consistent player all around. Brook Lopez is consistent, and around somebody like Giannis, you need consistent. No, I mean, don't worry, I think Giannis is going to have a three eventually, but I'm not not ne- not necessarily next year. I think he's going to have a three eventually. I think he'll at least be better the next year than he was this year. I think he still needs consistent shooters to throw back out to, you know, when it comes down to. And I think Mal- Malcolm Brogdon is a very good point guard and playmaker and play decision maker. If I had to pick, like, I might do Middleton and Lopez and just let knock. See, and that's the thing I'm saying. <sighs> Milwaukee is, has so many key players that it makes it difficult because you take out Brooke. It's like playing Jenga. You take out Brooke and now you have to replace him with a, with a center that can stretch the floor and guard space on the other side or at least guard guard like like get block shots and stuff be sort of a unicorn but then should have kept Don Baker if that's the case that's the one the bro that Giannis murdered this year that's the one bro Giannis made him look <laughs> mark my words bro all the meme channels can say whatever they want to playing with this man like Don Maker the GOAT this that and the third I'm telling you this man Don Maker he's he's definitely a stretch five the problem with him is that he never got the type of PT to really play I'm not saying he's some god or anything I used to think his cousin who's like coming up soon he's in the next draft class his son is crazy his cousin is ridiculous that's on a man. They got Bobo. Yo, if they, if they, got the thon, they should have got that. And that was exactly where I was going to go. I was going to say they struck out twice. That's the big thing. Because if Bobo pans out, mark my words, that would be the dumbest thing. Because they, they only, I don't, here's my thing, though. Milwaukee didn't have a pick this year, though. They had, they had a later pick. They had, late, they had late, late second round They pick. did have a second round pick, though. They traded their pick with Cleveland. That's what it was. So, so they, they wouldn't even had the shot at it. That would have been a perfect fit. That would have, like, I mean, if they didn't have a pick, then they just had a missed opportunity. But I would say if they did have a pick, it was even more of a missed opportunity to not swing on it. I feel like they didn't have a pick at all in the draft. If they didn't, if they didn't unless I from the traded pick to Cleveland, they didn't have another pick before somebody picked up over. Okay, I so, I mean, that would have definitely been a perfect fit. I mean, I don't know if because he's on the Nuggets as a, you know, a second-round pick, if that's somebody that you can, I don't know if you ever trade for a second-round pick until you've seen them do anything. I don't, I mean, who knows? All of it. Um, um, that would be perfect. I think, both will be fine. <laughs> I, think I think if he manages minutes well, I think he'll be he'll be pretty good. Like, I don't think he needs to be out here playing thirty minutes like he played over in Oregon. Like uh-huh. that's what that's 
you got hurt. You run to somebody that big for 30 minutes, that boy is going to get hurt. He's going to get tired. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to get hurt. Yeah, right. That body's going to start breaking down. So, I mean, I think you manage his minutes. Don't give him no more than 20. Especially, but in his rookie season, you give him about 12 to 15. Yeah, really. And, sure. and then let him run. I mean, you still got Juan Hurt and Gomez coming off behind Nikola with Jokic anyway. And then, don't they have somebody else behind him too? I think a Plumley brother on top yeah. of that? I'm behind yeah, him? Yeah, um, Marshall Miles. Yeah, uh, Miles Plumley. Yeah. I think Marshall's, yeah. I think Marshall's on the Trailblazers still. He's out of the league. He is? One, there's one Plumley brother that was on the Knicks that got knocked out of the league. There's one in, on Blazer time. No. You think of Myers, Myers Leonard, and then there was a Plumley on the Blazers at one point. And there's one on Denver. Oh. Going back to Milwaukee, as far as choosing That'd who I would pick, I honestly, I I would I would stick with Lopez and Middleton. Middleton gives sort of an offensive like you have Giannis who had struggles in the playoffs. Once everybody was just like, okay, we're gonna build a wall and then we're gonna not build a wall. Then we're gonna build a wall and then we're gonna not build a wall. But Ashton, three and D wings grow on tree, like literally, yeah. almost literally grow on trees, bro. Where? They, Where? Dude, they grow on trees to the point that people were saying the Rockets were a completely different team for losing Al Farouk Aminu and Trevor Ariza, Wait. who are both on their last contract at best. Aminu wasn't on the Rockets. He's on the Blazers. You were roasting him earlier. No, I'm saying <laughs> that, that was the squad he was I'm, on prior to that. Nah, you meant um Luke Richard and Bob Mute. Oh, was it Bob Mute? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, he's the same person. They're the same person. Person yeah. too. He's the exact same yeah. for Oh my god. That's a, okay. I don't even know if that's a race card or not, but I'm that was either way, those are literally the same person too. That's another one of those players that's the exact same. That was funny. Like now Trevor Ariza, I think, is both than better than both of them, but Alvaru Aminu and Ma Mute are the same person to me in terms of their skill set as only being able to bring the defensive aspect of that. And I feel like that's Ariza is the offensive aspect yeah. of that. But like you can't Chris Middleton is not the offensive and defensive end of that. I think Chris Middleton was a decent defender and a very good offensive player, but I think even the all-star thing selection was a fluke. I think he was just an all-star because the East is weak. So who would you replace Chris Middleton with? You talking about from a money standpoint? Like, literally, if you're Milwaukee, you say, Chris Middleton, get out of here. We're going to keep Brooke. We're going to keep Malcolm. We're going to replace you with... I mean, at that point, I think it really just depends on what forwards you're trying to look at in terms of replace. I mean, I don't know all the forwards that are on the market. Chris Middleton is just at the top of them. I think Tobias would be a perfect fit as a shooter. I mean, I know from a defensive aspect, he's not superb at def- as a defensive player, but you have Giannis at the four right behind you. And if you're keeping, I think I think if it's Malcolm Brogdon and Brooke Lopez, you have Brooke Lopez and Giannis in there. And then you still have Malcolm Brogdon who's really good defensively from a perimeter defender standpoint. And then, I mean, insert two guard here, I guess, because I really don't know who they want to keep running out there because Eric Bledsoe and him could not really play at the same time in terms of Eric Bledsoe and Malcolm Brogdon. It doesn't work very per- but very good. They probably shouldn't have kept Eric. I, that, I agree with that 100%, but I think he earned his keep and it's kind of like one of those things where you play well enough where when your contract conversation comes up they kind of can't tell you no so they kind of have to tell you yes i think that's essentially what happened so i think with that whole thing if they're keeping if they keep brooke and malcolm i think getting somebody like tobias as a second option scorer consider that malcolm brogdon is a good distributor and does run the offense very well i mean you're talking about Giannis inside tobias outside versus I mean Chris Middleton is a question mark offensively like I mean I know he averaged 20 plus points or whatever but I mean I think I think as a second option you can expect a ton from Tobias and he already proved it because he was doing it as a number one option for the Clippers which tells me enough where I can say as a second option he can still give you a bucket so if you had to replace somebody that's who I'd pick I guess yeah for me I would probably keep Chris and keep Lopez and maybe try to sign Brogdon a little bit lower fandom wise is there anyone that Tyler for the Cavaliers you want? Is there anyone for the Bulls, Jalen, that you want? Is there anyone like fandom wise? Because I don't really have a pick because I know the Wizards are not going to do anything. So I don't know. I'm, re- I'm so ready for basketball to start. <laughs> Time of my career player. He's doing well for them. <laughs> hey, yo. <laughs> I'm dead. I don't know. So. 
I would say if I had to go fandom on it, bro, with the Bulls, I mean, I'm going to stay out the Lewis King wheelhouse because I already preached myself to death with that one. I'm going to say, personally, bro, I'm good. I mean, I know it sounds weird for a rebuilding team to want to stay pat like that. I think cool little signups like Patrick Beverly or something like that would be cool. But, like, for the most part, I'm good. I don't really need anybody else thrown on my squad right now because I want to just kind of keep building through the draft and see what's up and, I mean, go from there. What do you think D-Rose will go? Because he's a free agent. I don't want him either. I feel like we're going to get wrapped up. I, as a as a D Rose fan, that would be me. But the timeline's not there. I feel like we're re, I feel like we're going. We're looking at rebuilding too correct right now, and it's way off of that. And just start signing a bunch of veterans. I can't. I you can't might do it though, knowing guard packs. I'm not trying to wish that on you. I just no. I'm, I mean, I'm just content with it at this point. I would say personally, stay away from my team because I want to keep the rebuild consistent. But they might like because you know Chicago loves him. You know he's the savior that was. You know, unfortunately injured they love him like a son hey quick hey future me edit this so like it replays that part where i was like <gasps> and then i like for some reason mysteriously didn't tell tyler or Jalen what i was thinking do you can we just agree the nba awards are stupid yes was literally before because the nba awards are what tomorrow i think so i think they're I'll literally put tomorrow. The date in when i find it because i'm gonna be screenshotting a lot of stuff we're going to the award show tomorrow mvp is who yeah that's my that's my last call is who Giannis. Who is yeah Giannis, Damn, don't right. tell me you really think James Harden was. No, I mean I got I got Giannis, but I was exp- I was expecting somebody to give me the stati- the statistical argument. No, I just want to see who wins. Yeah, yeah. facts. That's what I like the award shows. We're waiting too long. I want to see who wins. The, I want to see who wins the award at the end of the season, so yeah. I don't have to think about what they did in the playoffs. Yeah, because that's yeah. what was exci- that's what made it exciting though. Because remember, like way back when, when um friggin' David Robinson won it, and then Hakeem roasted him because he was so mad. Like, I can give you. I can give you a better analogy. They gave D Rose his at a Chicago Bulls home game right before the playoffs started. LeBron, that's man. how it should go. Yeah. Merc, Merc, or no Merc, that's how it should go down. That, that was because Stephen A. brought this up not too long ago, and I was like, I really liked his point on this. It was like this is an event fans can't even go to. Like we can't really even afford. Like everyday fans can't just afford to go to a, to the NBA award show. Like you know, back in the day, we used to be just be able to come to the game. And you see your favorite player get the MVP on your favorite team. You know, you get to see that live in the stadium. You know, that's unbelievable. But now it's like you got to wait. You go until after the playoffs to see an awards show. After the draft, too. After the draft, too. So, like, everybody out here right now, like, if we're being honest, out here right now, everybody's like, well, where are the free agents going to go? Because no one cares at this point, like, who is MVP. Like, we... We want to know who got it because we just, at this point, we just want to work it. As pretty much most of us already have it predetermined who we think is going to be at this yeah, point. So it's like, at this point, we're just kind of like, all right, so that's cool, but like, where's KD going to go? Where's Clay going to go? Where's. Where is Kyrie gonna go? Where are these guys gonna go? Like we don't even care anymore. Yeah, NBA awards. I mean, yeah, it just sucks that they're 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 so late because no one cares anymore. Everybody wants to see where the free agents go. With the NBA awards too, it kind of feeds into that sort of narrative thing that I was kind of hinting at, where you're kind of moving the goalposts because Russell Westbrook won it, and that was more narrative based than legitimate. And now people were trying to take away from Giannis because. James Harden conveniently just woke up and stopped procrastinating and was like, all right, I'm going to play really, 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 really well for like a good enough time till we make it to the playoffs. I'm going to just start, I'm going to go 2K mode and just not stop scoring. And then people are going to be like, oh, and because already James Harden has this weird thing where everybody thinks that he deserved every MVP that he didn't win. Like everyone's been arguing that. I mean, beyond that, like beyond those NBA awards, I mean, MVP seems to be the one that everybody kind of cares about. As far as six man, Lou Williams is probably going to win it. What other award? Coach? of the year is going to be weird because like can you be coach of the year and have the MVP because it feels like it's like well you had a cheat code in your game so did you really win or did you just use what was in front of you to win or like it's like beyond that I think it's Doc Rivers and like Mike Malone for the Nuggets Yes, yes. That would be mine, personally. Mine, mine would definitely be Doc Rivers. I can't blame I mean, for that one, either. I mean, it's not even just because it was just 
you know, for him to not have not have a star on that team and still do what he did, still take them to what six games, the best team, fully loaded, no injuries. You know, come on, now, and beat them by thirty in one game. You know, it shows some kind of discipline as a coach. You know, a lot of players yeah. that look like they fall into his system and how they're going to do. It takes a lot for for to get a whole team of players to buy into your system. Like, and that's just the kind of coach he is. He that's why I like Doc Rivers so much because I haven't seen a team where Doc Rivers had players who just don't buy into his system. I mean, so. you kind of had the, the whole Lob City Clippers when they got towards the end of that run. I think it had more to do with players and the fact that he was GMing and the, the, his son happened to be on the team, which I mean, would leave a sour taste in anybody's mouth. That's like an AAU team where your star player is the son. Well, yeah, we're going to run the ball through him. Whether the fact that he is the star player or the fact that he's the son, the ball was going to touch his hands. It's kind of the same outlook, even if it wasn't valid. I mean, that's just, that's a bad narrative. So Yeah, so I guess beyond that, like NBA awards will be okay, but we give it kind of an F out of an A because like, there's no reason they should be this late. Change it. Literally, everybody's telling you change it. This has been Three man window. Ugly. <laughs> but we still get the job done. We grit and grind out here. All right. And we out.